Uh, so without further ado, I give word to our first speaker in this session, that is Igor Petkovic from the University of Sarajevo Faculty of Law, and the subject of his paper is The Possible Existence of Matriarchy in Egypt in the Days of Herodotus and Its Potential Roots in the Culture of the New Kingdom. So Igor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nina. So as you said, my name is Igor Petkovic, University of Public School at Sarajevo. Uh, so let me just say it is a privilege to address you all today and to be a part of this uh, conference. So I thank the organizers and professors, especially Professor Elizabeth for her keynote lecture. And I also would like to apologize for being so late in delivering the essay. It wasn't because of COVID, it was because of me. I sort of regretted halfway through that I chose this topic because I believe it was too comprehensive when it comes to uh, analyzing the law and customs of ancient Egyptians. And I was also too much focused on proving the actual hypothesis, and I figured that not all hypotheses can actually be proved. And I'm, I'm starting to think that this is actually one of them. So I'll just start with the hypothesis itself. It's that um, matriarchy existed in the era of Herodotus in ancient Egypt, and it, that it potentially had roots in the New Kingdom culture. And now Herodotus actually said this, Herodotus actually is considered to be the founder of gender studies in ancient Egypt. And he did that with a, with a single sentence, because he says in his second book about Egypt, of his histories, that because of specific climate and relief, Egyptians developed some specific customs that are peculiar to any other nation in the world. For example, women are the ones to attend the marketplace and men stay home and weave not only attend the marketplace, but also do other daily tasks, and men stay home and be. And of course, this was in stark contradiction with what Herodotus had known in Greece, but not only in Greece, but in other nations that he visited, where gender roles were completely reversed, because women were the ones to stay at home with the children. Now, but the problem is, is that Herodotus devotes this, let's say, hypothesis, only half a sentence, because he continues, he says, men stay at home and weave, and then he continues with the ways in which Egyptians weave, which are also different to the ways in which the Greeks weave. So one is even compelled to think that his gender, gender talk was just an introduction to the forms of weaving of Egyptians and Greeks. And because of this, because he doesn't provide us with enough resources to actually delve a little bit, a little bit deeper into this uh, hypothesis, or because he seems not to have an interest of showing that, that is definitely the first nail in this hypothesis. Now, the second one is, I'm afraid, even larger, because as we know, Egyptian state itself wasn't matriarchal. It was a patriarchal, deeply rooted patriarchal, patriarchal state. So every pharaoh except for one was male, and even Hatshepsut, that was the, real, the only real female pharaoh, was completely erased from the Egyptian history by her successor, Thutmose III, and only that, only under the justification that she was in fact a woman and only a male, a male man can be a legitimate pharaoh. And all the administrative positions, the higher administrative positions were always run by men. The heads of provinces were also men. So we have no mention of women. But we have to consider that in the fifth century BC, when Herodotus actually visited Egypt, Egypt was under the, under the rule of the Persians. So at that time, Egyptian men were actually not in charge of the Egyptian state. It was the Persian Sattva, the Persian governor, and all the higher administrative officials at the time were also Persians. So we cannot say that we are only concerned about the relationships between the individuals themselves. So we only concern ourselves today with private law, not public law. Um, and private law is a bit more difficult to to observe, because it doesn't change by the lapse of dynasties. And when dynasties change, change, you know, public law change, but private law doesn't. It evolves gradually through time. And so what I chose the New Kingdom culture as like the reference point, simply because the late period in which Herodotus lived is so difficult to trace, because after the New Kingdom, uh, Egypt is full of various revolts and internal strife. The third intermediate period, the Assyrian invasion, the Persian invasion, it's, there, are, there aren't that many documents from that period simply because of uh, all the wars and rebellions and so on. So New Kingdom is a, is a really good reference point, but also one other, one other difficulty that we have in analyzing Egyptian history is basically the, the discrepancy between how 
Egyptian historiography works and the way Egyptian legal system works, because Egyptian legal system is based entirely on custom, so it's just customary law. There's nothing in Egyptian history even resembling a statute. Not only statute in modern sense of the word, but statute in the Roman sense of the word, the code of Hammurabi sense of the word. So there's nothing. And Egyptian historiography is very rigid. It's full of these formulas, mortuary texts, uh, religious texts. So if we want to, if we want to find out how people actually lived, which we need to know, if we want to uncover the private law, how private law works. We need, we need texts that show how people actually live, not some ri uh, rigid religious texts. And that's why Herodotus is considered the founder of gender law in Egypt with his one sentence, not even one sentence, and a thousand other Egyptian documents that we have are not considered to have founded the gender studies in Egypt. So, but I mean, we have to work with what we have. So we are going to delve into the new kingdom, some new kingdom manuscripts. I compiled like the, the list of some I would regard the most important, just to paint a general picture of um, relationships between genders because we have a limited amount of time. So first of all, let's just say that when it comes to, when it comes to purpose of, yes, we, we are only going to speak about the common people here. So I'm not going to talk about pharaoh's marriages and I don't know, princess marriages. So just the, the relationships between men and women as peasants, builders, scribes, so common people in Egypt. So when it comes to these common people, they, I believe they are equal in a way that they have a unique purpose. They don't have any higher purpose in the mind of the Egyptians. Their only pur real purpose is to provide an offspring for the upcoming generation. So they need to procreate. That's their main reason why, why they're on earth. And in some more affluent, like middle class citizens, like scribes, we see on their mortuary tombs um, how they brag about having raised a lot of children and having left some descendants on earth. And the, basically, the idea of a marriage functions the same way. The most, when we uh, read the Egyptian documents, the most common word for marriage is ken. And ken is basically like the most colloquial term we can find. And ken means like to kiss, to embrace, to make love to someone. So it's really like the factual act of love. And it also means marriage. And it's the most used word to describe marriage. So we can actually see how marriage works. It doesn't need any in any legal framework, any legal requirements. It only needs two people that love each other and they, um, and that they can later procreate an offspring and leave something behind them. But of course, marriage, even if it doesn't have any legal background, any legal expression, it needs to have some expression. And for the Egyptians, that was the, the community in which a couple lived. So they needed to live together to be married. And the same logic applies for divorce so once they're split apart, they're considered divorced. There are no formalities whatsoever in that process as well. And we find an interesting term in the in the other text, it's the Doom Prince. It's one of the, it's actually the Middle Kingdom story, but okay, it's the same indigenous culture of the ancient Egyptians. I use it because it really, this term is really useful. It's Gerg Per. Now Gerg means to found, to erect, to, to build. And Per means, basically means predominantly Ha, uh, palace, yeah, like per a, uh, like fera. It has the same meaning, but actually, it can mean also house. And ger per primarily means to build a city, to erect a city, because like the palace is the main, like the central object of a city. So ger per is just to found a city. But in this metaphorical way, it means to found a household. So actually, that the couple lives together along with their children, like the offspring of their marriage. So those are like the two most common, commonly words used phrases. So we need mutual affection and the the actual community, like the whole cohabitat of a husband and a wife to, for marriage to exist. And let me just point out also that woman and man in Egypt, were they were this, they use the same word for those terms as husband and wife. So hemet is woman and like the feminine noun is hemet, it has a T ending and hem is a man, so it's a masculine. No. And Hamet also means the woman and a wife, and Ham means a man and also a husband. So it basically shows that it is expected, it's like an obligation for both for both genders when they reach maturity, when they reach adulthood, it is in their obligation to, to get married. So it doesn't really matter if we refer to them as a man or a husband or a woman or a wife, because once he reaches the adulthood, man needs to become a husband, woman needs to become a wife. So it basically, it, they have the same word. 
Um, yeah, so when we compare these terms, we see that, okay, we can agree that both men and women had the same, the equal purpose when it comes to raising children, but we don't still know what were the relations between them. So who had the predominant role and who didn't. And for that, I, I found this other term, which is really useful. Um, it's ta hemet. Now, hemet, as we said, means wife, and ta actually means to place, to put. And it basically means to put a wife, but in a meaning that to like to house a wife, to provide for the wife. And it's actually the first term I found relating to marriage that actually uh, depicts man as being proactive, as a, doing something, and woman as a passive, like an object and versus the subject. So, and I didn't find any example of the vice versa, so where the term where a woman is proactive and a man is is like an object in that in that phrase. So yeah, I mean it's we only need to we don't need to prove that major thing existed in the New Kingdom. I've found this hypothesis like we can prove that there's some reasonable doubt for some foundations of matriarchy to exist in the New Kingdom to say that it evolved gradually into matriarchy in the late kingdom. But it's it's uh, with this with these examples it's really hard to, to define it. And I also used like the most famous example of the alleged better position of women in ancient Egypt rather than in any other ancient society. And that's the Ostrakon DM764. Yeah, that's definitely the most important one because it's it says that when they're divorced, man and a woman, uh, they receive one third of the joint marital property and the, the third third is re, um, like it's left for the children. And so, yeah, people painted a picture of genders being equal basically based on that Ostrakhan because it's very simple. It tells us, yes, wife receives the same amount of money. I mean, the same amount of that joint mass as the man, so they must be equal. But that's not the full picture, and I, need, I really need to address this at this point because, first of all, children always stay, stay with the man, uh, with husband, I mean, prior husband. And, I mean, yeah, that's, that was a general, general rule. So I believe women could sometimes argue that children could stay with her. I don't know. But yeah, the, the general rule, I believe, is that women should, uh, in that case, prove why the children should, should stay with her and not with the husband. So as a general rule, yes, children stay with the husband. And that's not the only discriminatory provision in this case. Uh, it's not only this immaterial aspect, but also quite a material one. Because you see, we need to understand how Egyptian society actually worked. Egyptian society wasn't like a capitalistic society. They didn't have money per se. They only had like highly tradable commodities, liquid commodities that they used as money. But in order for, for us to have money, it, like liquidity is not the only trade of money. Money is also has a great uh, way to um, price ratio, it's easily transported, and it's also easily accumulated. But in Egypt, they couldn't do that. And you can't really accumulate something like grain because it spoils and it inflates. Chain, prices change annually due to the harvest. So it's very complicated. And you see, Egyptians actually didn't accumulate wealth. They did something, what they do in life, they received what they need to receive to survive. They traded maybe a little, but it was only a supplement to what they actually had. So they didn't actually accumulate anything. They lived from, from one harvest to another, just like the Nile. They, they behaved in the same way. So when we say, in this case, the man always stayed in the household and the woman needed to leave. And yes, she did carry that one third of the joint marital property, but it's, it's really doubtful what she can actually do with it, given the fact that Egyptian society functions in this way. One third, even if it's the same amount, uh, amount of commodities as the husband, one can doubt that it actually can compensate for the safety of her household because we can definitely say, okay, it was better, the position of woman from this example is better than, for example, in ancient Rome, where she was in under the potestas of her husband. I mean, the like the original early stages of Roman development. So she's clearly not under her husband's potestas and she's clearly not only entitled to her dowry, so the stuff that she brought into her household, she has she's entitled to one, those one-thirds, but if she can actually do anything with those one-thirds, if we said that Egyptians do not actually accumulate money, so that one-third is actually, I believe in most cases, it's not a lot of money, it's not a lot of funds that she can actually do something with them. 
And so I believe in many cases, although it's hard to prove, because especially in the lower classes, I believe when upon the divorce, when a man was left with his with his children in her in their household, the woman I believe needed to return to her parents, just as if she was under the protestas of her husband. So even though formally, yes, there's a clear distinction and women's rights are a bit improved when compared to the other civilizations, I believe when we when we consider facts that it's actually it's actually actually not that great. And it's far from from it be, being considered matriarchal. So I'm just gonna because yeah, I believe I I should be wrapping up right now. So I'm just gonna give some my opinions in the end. So I believe that Herodotus uh, didn't actually um, he didn't lie about what he saw. He actually saw some examples of gender roles being reversed in ancient Egypt. But I I think it's just a fragment of what he actually could have seen and could have written about. I believe he just wanted to make a point, an interesting point, that gender roles in Egypt are reversed, are completely reversed, and they probably weren't, they, they, they were just, I don't know, partial, like there were examples of it. And there was examples, I believe, only in the north, because Herodotus only visited the north of Egypt, and the north was like a conglomerate of various cultures, towns, uh, it had these huge tradable cities that had money, so the, the the reality in the north was completely different than what in the south. The south remained rural and quite, I believe, conservative. So, and if he actually visited the south, I think he would encounter something more, more like this, more like these examples that I just uh, presented. So, uh, yeah. So, matriarchy, in my opinion, did not exist. It could not have existed. I tried maybe to uh, provide some answers of why it could have existed. I believe that. The thing that really um, is like different with Egyptians than any other civilization in the ancient world is that they had the nationhood. So they actually perceived one another as being part of the same nation. And that's that's really like the the main thing when we consider the longevity of Egyptian civilization when compared to the other civilizations in the Middle East that did not last nearly enough as the Egyptians. And I thought that maybe because they perceived themselves as being part of a single nation, then we can place them in a, in a context similar to basically the context of our nation states of the 20th century. We can see that uh, women's rights evolved. So they evolved in the past 50 years, they evolved in the past 100 years. So why couldn't they have evolved in ancient Egypt for those 500 to 600 years between the new kingdom and the late kingdom? But it's, it has so few documents, and I have so few documents that I could actually reach, and I believe those that argumentation then needed to needed some comparable uh, comparable analysis between Egypt and, for example, other uh, civilizations of the Mesopotamia and Greeks and Romans. So I believe that line of argumentation would have been too just too complex and too too much for this project. But it's something really I believe is interesting generally, and I believe that Egyptian law should not have been, should not be considered as a static object, and it's, you it usually is. So we have to consider that Egyptians are the 4,000 year old, so 4, 000, have a lifespan of 4,000 years, and in that lifespan, the position of women change. So it's not one single position of women in the society, it's million positions of women in million different moments in history. So yeah, we the, even though this hypothesis is, in my opinion, not proved, it really uh, depicts something far more interesting. And that's uh, that we don't have to jump to conclusions and say that it is inherent in the Egyptians that women are, have the um, more rights than in any other civilization. So everything that Herodotus actually did in his book, so everything has a has an answer, a question and an answer, and has its justification. For Herodotus found this justification in climate and relief. I don't think that's, yeah, I mean, it doesn't even matter what the justification of Herodotus is, because I don't believe major he actually existed, but that Herodotus was just trying to make a point. But even though, well, well uh, still, the important, the important the thing is that, you know, one civilization isn't just like one moment. So we have to consider the entire context and usually uh, requires a lot of research, but the, the answer is always uh, has many angles and has many different sides to it. So. Yeah, that that should that is in short my presentation for today. I hope you like it.
Thank you very much, dear colleague Igor Pet Petkovic, sorry for this very interesting uh, paper. Uh, I would like to ask you if there are any questions concerning this, as I said, very, very interesting topic. No. Okay, thank you once again. I would like to give a word to our next participant. She is Danica Karamarković. She comes from uh, the Faculty of Law, University of Belgrade, and she will speak also about very interesting topic concerning position of women as mothers, daughters, and widows in Hammurabi Code. Please, you can start your exposition. Thank you, Professor. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is, as I was introduced, uh, Danica Karamarković, and I'm going to speak about the position of women in uh, Hammurabi Code. Uh, most, more specifically, I'm going to speak about position as a mother, daughter, and a widow. Uh, before I start uh, about the main points of my work, I would like to just add uh, why I chose this topic in the first place. Uh, first of all, uh, Hammurabi Code is one of the most significant uh, law codes uh, in the ancient world. And uh, we don't have to be law or history majors in order for us to already have heard about uh, Hammurabi Code or at least um, know some basic of it. Uh, Hammurabi Code is uh, one of the great uh, representatives of uh, the codes of the ancient world because uh, it has a lot of legal transplants that uh, are shown in uh, the codification itself and uh, also has many influences in it. Uh, the influences beside the other laws are also religion, social status, uh, then also uh, maybe some of the um, uh, customs and many other things. Um, when I say what is the essence, uh, if we're going to talk about the essence of the Hammurabi Code, uh, we can say the main point, the main goal of uh, the, the making of a law code is, uh, first of all, to um, secure and establish peace. And then, uh, most, important, most importantly for maybe family law, is to have a um, mention of a species, more specifically to uh, provide a children. Um, when I speak about the first role, and that is a role of a mother or a role as a wife, uh, is uh, first of all, marriage is monogamous. And uh, marriage is only uh, allowed uh, if it was uh, made by contract. Contract is a very important step into uh, a marriage. Uh, so, like I said, marriage is monogamous. That means that a man could have uh, concubines and a uh, can cheat, cheat a wife, but he couldn't have another legal wife. Uh, but, again, on the other side, he could remarry in uh, three particular cases. First case is if his wife is ill, and that when I say ill, I mean uh, incurably, uh, she has an incurable disease. Uh, and uh, then he could bring another wife, he could, but he must uh, keep his wife safe and at home. Uh, then the other uh, reason is if uh, his wife decides to leave a home and without a particular reason, then he should uh, divorce her in the first place, or if he doesn't want to divorce, he could uh, leave her in a house as a slave. Um, and the third most important reason is if a woman is infertile. Um, that is a very special part because uh, like I said, the very important step, uh, the very important goal of the Kamarabian Code was to prolong the family. And uh, that means she could, uh, if she was infertilized, that means she, they, they couldn't have children. And uh, with that being said, women, uh, women in general could bring a concubine uh, to his husband, uh, to her husband in order for them to have children. Uh, then there is a specific case when we are speaking about the daughters. Uh, there are daughters that were dedicated to the gods. I'm going to speak about it um, in a short time. Um, the daughters that were dedicated to the gods couldn't have children. They were not allowed to have children. And uh, for that way, uh, they could bring shugitu, that is a special term, 
uh, that was used for uh, sisters of a daughters or adopted sisters that were there to provide children um, as uh, exchange for their, their sisters. Uh, when we're speaking about uh, marriage gifts, very important uh, point uh, in Hammurabi code, uh, we have different types. First, marriage gift uh, that preceded the marriage was tirhatu uh, or tirhatu. Uh, that was uh, a gift that groom could give to a um, father of a daughter, and that was uh, having a point. Different, different. Uh, there are different uh, interpretations of that gift. One is that it's a purchase of a wife, and the other is that it's kind of like a down payment or to secure, uh, to give a secure that he's going to marry that daughter of his, the, that father. Uh, the other one is a biblu. Biblu is also some type of uh, gift that was uh, given to the other members of the family, uh, such as mother, daughters, and everybody else in the family. And we have one that is the most important, that is sheriktu. Uh, sheriktu is uh, actually um, a gift that um, father would give to uh, his to a future husband of his daughter. And uh, it's specifically uh, made for a daughter, but a daughter can never use it. It doesn't matter if she's a daughter or she's a wife. Uh, she couldn't use it. She can only give to her husband and he can use it, but he can't sell it. Uh, so the purpose of that gift, uh, or actually that is a dowry, uh, is uh, that um, it is to secure children and to secure their inheritance after uh, the marriage. Uh, when we're speaking about the criminal law that is very uh, special and very, very important in the Hammurabi Code, um, we have to say that the most important thing and the most interesting thing is about the cheating. Um, so man could cheat a wife with a concubine anytime, but a woman couldn't cheat a man uh, and uh, he had uh, different types of uh, punishment if she could cheat a, a man. So for the first reason, she could, man could forgive a wife uh, for a cheating him, but that makes her automatically a slave. Uh, then uh, on the other side, if he finds his wife with uh, a lover, he could uh, punish her uh, by sending her and then uh, her and her lover will be binded and thrown into water. Uh, then on the other side, if somebody suspects on the wife that is, she is a cheater. Um, she had to prove and give an oath uh, that is called something like a God's ju uh, judgment, uh, where she comes into water and uh, she jumps into water. And if she drowns, she is um, she was thought as a uh, guilty, and that was her punishment. Uh, and then if she floats on the water, she was um, thought as innocent. Uh, there are, of course, different interpretations of that, and it's very interesting that uh, different people in different cultures, cultures that uh, took this uh, this particular case, were different. Um, it had a different um, ways of uh, thinking of this. For one example, some of them were thought in thinking that if she drowns, she is guilty, which is um, very um, she is innocent which is very illogical, but in this particular case, in Hammurabi code, if she drowns, she was considered uh, guilty. Um, if we're speaking about the divorce, both of them had the right to divorce, but a woman, uh, of course, had a very particular case in which she could divorce without any consequences. Uh, with that being said, woman, women have to be, uh, first of all, very prudent and very flawless and she had to be uh, mistreated by her husband in order for her to divorce without any consequences. Women who had children uh, could even uh, inherit, if she brings up the children, she could inherit one, point, uh, one part uh, as uh, a male inheritant. Uh, and uh, she could, uh, after that, uh, choose her husband, which is very interesting. Um, so when we're speaking about the position of daughter, one position of a daughter, one type of daughter, I already explained uh, that is a daughter that is going to marry 
and uh, she's going to get her dowry. Uh, but then there is other type, as I mentioned, the type of daughter that is dedicated to the gods. They have a very spe special and very um, very special position. First of all, they were dedicated to the gods, and one uh, a term that uh, actually um, presented them is Naditu. Uh, that's actually um, on one side, uh, it was um, a woman that was dedicated to the god Shamash, and the other side, the w w women who were dedicated to the god Marduk. Uh, on the god Shamash, uh, it was forbidden for them to marry, and uh, they were actually uh, had an ability to uh, receive a dowry and uh, to um, bring them to the temple. And the other that is uh, dedicated to the god of Marduk could actually uh, marry, but she couldn't have the children. And as I explained, she could, uh, in that case, have Shugitu. Uh, also, there are different types of uh, women that were dedicated to um, to the gods. One of them is Kulamisitu. Uh, she was actually into a sacred prostitution. Uh, it's very specific because it wasn't like a basic prostitution because it was sacred and it was uh, it was not about the act. It was about the goal of it. The goal was uh, and the essence of it was it to be dedicated to the gods and. Um, because of that, they were not, uh, they were treated as a moral creatures. Um, so, um, there is again one, another, um, type of daughter that was called Entu. Uh, her reason was, uh, she was, uh, actually having, uh, ability to sleep with the ruler, uh, but not to sleep as a prostitute again, then more likely to sleep as a god. So it was some type of ceremony, ceremony to the gods. Um, the very special uh, inheritance is about um, daughters that were dedicated to the gods because uh, they were, first of all, uh, they had the ability to, um, to uh, inherit the same as a man. Uh, so as a sons, uh, sh she could inherit as the point as she was uh, one of the sons. Uh, also, uh, she, uh, the, the women who were dedicated to the god of Marduk can also leave uh an inheritance to uh their children which was very special and very interesting when we're speaking about a criminal law it's very interesting part about a wine cellars first of all when we say wine cellars it is very specific because um we can find from that that a woman could be a wine cellar but it wasn't very moral uh, act which we can conclude from it uh, because um, there is one um, uh, spe spe specific act where uh, they say that if a daughter dedicated to the gods enters um, um, one of the wine cellars um, shops, she will uh, be uh, burned to death. Uh, and also um, the thoughts of the other researchers is that they were kind of like uh, prostitutes. Uh, wine cellars and all that uh, place where they were connected was kind of seen as a brothel. Um, and lastly, the position of a widow. Uh, it's a very interesting position and the reason why I chose this is because it is a um, very uh, good position, of course speaking in the matter of law, um, because they could inherit, um, first of all, after the death of his of her husband, she could, a woman could inherit a dowry that she received already from her uh, father, and uh, she could inherit uh, Nudunum. Nudunum was a special gift that a uh, wife would receive, would receive from her husband while she was married with him. And uh, she could use it, and of course she didn't have the ability to sell it, but she could use it and then later on uh, proceed it to her children as inheritance. Uh, so, uh, something that is very special is that uh, if we're speaking about a concubine that was um, in, um, had a children with, um, with a man after his death, she was not allowed uh, to inherit anything. She was just uh, allowed to be freed. Um, so, that's it, that it, that it, that's it for the position of widow. And uh, for the conclusion, I have to say, first of all, we are speaking about very patriarchal um, understanding of this. Uh, and uh, they were very patriarchal uh, society, and uh, they were built from the customs, religion, social orders, um, and their goal was, as I said, to prolong the family. 
and in order to prolong the family they were uh, having very um very strict rules and very cruel rules in criminal and uh, family law just to make sure they um they reduce any potential uh, obstacles of uh, divorce and uh, the separation of a family so my personal opinion about the position of women was it that it wasn't very good um that we had they were not definitely uh disfranchised completely but we can say it was a good position because um they were not allowed to choose they were born as a role and they were dedicated to that role and that was the purpose of their lives uh so that's uh, briefly uh, explained my um, that's my briefly uh, presentation of my work if there are any questions i will be more than likely to answer them and attention uh, thank you very much dear colleague so uh, i would like to ask uh, from my side if there any que if, if there any question among students or other participants including my colleagues maybe Oh. Now, Milos Stankovic, I see him. Maybe he wants to ask something. No, if it yes, Milos, I can. I cannot hear you. Okay, maybe there is a problem uh, with the sound. So uh thanks a lot and now we move from uh, from belgrade to czech republic and uh, the colleague uh, jan tranzik will uh, speak about very interesting uh question concerning uh liberate marriage through the ages so we will have uh, an overview uh, in which regions this kind of marriage uh, took place so i would like to give you uh, a word we cannot hear you uh yeah thank you very much for the introduction i am now uploading a presentation so i hope it works file is being loaded so we need to wait uh then i would like to tell you because we have time limit so please um Take care of 15 minutes, which is the maximum of your <laughs> position. So keep in mind. Yes, uh, uh, thank is you very much. Very, uh, yes. Sorry. Thank you very much for the introduction again. Ladies and gentlemen, in this presentation, I am going to talk about levirate marriage. First of all, what is that? A levirate marriage is a union of a widow and the brother of her deceased husband. Uh, the word lavir itself means brother-in-law, that would be for the etymology. What is the purpose of the levirate? Uh, why does anybody do that? Well, we can see uh, three main purposes uh, of the Institute. First of them is an economic purpose. If a widow has some property, the Leverate Union ensures that the property stays in her husband's family's sphere of influence. As a second one, I would mention the social purpose. That is more important if the widow has little or, or no property, uh, then the leverate marriage means somebody takes care of her, provides her with some welfare. And the last purpose would be biological one, which is of importance if the husband died before he could have children with the widow. Then his brother engenders the offspring in his place. And in some cultures, the children born from the union uh, are legally seen as the children of the dead man the former husband. In my research, I have been writing about liberate in different cultures and different times, but here I would like to particularly talk about two uh, themes, liberate in ancient Israel and then in medieval Livonia. In Jewish 
uh, Israeli legal documents, the duty of levirate is mentioned in the Bible in Deuteronomy. The purpose of the institute in the society was not so much about property, but rather about keeping the line going, avoiding uh, blotting the name out of Israel, where Israel means the Jewish society. In the Mishnah or Talmud, which are kind of a commentaries to the Bible, we can find another information on this topic. For example, the deliberate... Since you can scroll the presentation now, I've made you the presenter. I think that way we, we will see your slides. Sorry for the, the delay, I was briefly away from the computer. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so now you can see the slide elaborate in ancient Israel. Yes, that's what we're seeing. At least Super. Me. Perfect. Thank you. So in Mishnah and Talmud, uh, which are the commentaries to the Bible, we can find another information on this topic. For example, the deliberate was done only if the man had no children. Uh, from that marriage or from outside that marriage uh, and including daughters. Although the biblical text uh, says uh, about having no son, the daughters were also included to this. Uh, and even when the conditions for the liberate were met, the man still had a chance to avoid it. That required a special ritual called Chalitza, which is also described further in the Deuteronomy. The widow needed to pull his sandal off his foot to spit into his face and to say that this man does not build up his brother's house. This ritual is humiliating by its nature and it was quite a shame for a man to refuse to perform levirate. However, on some occasions uh, it was necessary to do chalitza as the brother-in-law cannot marry the widow, for example, because he is already married. In um, ancient times, polygamy was allowed in Jewish society, but later it was forbidden. Also in Christianity, which is kind of derivate of uh, Jewish religion, the relevant passage from Deuteronomy is seen as obsolete and deliberate is not performed in Christian societies. Moreover, marrying one's in-laws may be forbidden in canonic law of some Christian churches. Livonians living in the Baltics in modern Estonia and Latvia were once pagans. Since the 12th century, missionaries, especially from the Teutonic order, were converting them to Christian faith. In that times, it was impossible for a Roman Catholic to perform a levirate marriage. But the Pope, Innocent III, issued a bulla, Deusqui Ecclesiam, in which he expressly allowed Livonian people to marry widows of their dead brothers. There is not stated why. Nevertheless, in a chronicle of Henricus de Latis, uh, in Serbian it is Chronica Henrica od Livonie, there is described an interesting wartime custom of the Baltics. After a battle, the winning tribe kidnapped all the women they found. And this was done to prevent the brothers of the defeated and killed enemies to marry the widows, uh, perform the levirate marriage, and have children with them, therefore to continue the enemy uh, family. As the levirate was allowed by Pope only for converted to Christianity, but not for people who were already born as Christians, it has disappeared from the Baltics in the course of 13th century. <laughs> How do I move it? Yeah. Nevertheless, the levirate marriage is not dead. In some places of the world, it appears in customary law, uh, although it is uh, slowly disappearing together with globalization and other modern phenomena. The levirate marriage is nowadays probably most common in Africa. There, a factor contributing to rejecting levirate marriage among uh, people is also AIDS pandemic. Uh, the family of her husband does not want to take a widow who is or might be infected with the deadly uh, disease. But that can cause problems for her. Uh, if uh, her brother-in-law doesn't uh, take care of her, and uh, if the national welfare system is non-existent in those countries, the widows may be dependent on begging or prostitution, which is of course dangerous. 
Moreover, the Leverite also appears in some conservative Jewish circles in modern Israel, where it still follows the biblical rules, or in Kurdish families, where also the opposite institute is present. A widower, a man, often marries his deceased wife's sister. That has its own name, sororate, as soror means sister in Latin. As a conclusion, uh, I would like to show that although we can see the liberate marriage as an old-fashioned and obsolete legal institute in some parts of the world, in customary law, which is for some people far more important than uh, state law, it is still present and has its important social function. That would be all from me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan. And now our final presenter is Sima Zivulovic with his paper, Women in Their Legal Position in India During the Classical Hindu Law Period. Seema, if I understood correctly, you also have a presentation, yes? Yes, I prepared one. I am just okay, about I'm, to share it. Just a moment. Okay, I'm making you the presenter now, so you can scroll the presentation. Oh, just a moment. It's about to open. Oh, just a moment. Okay, here it is. Okay. If you can just full screen, oh, yes. Maybe oh. you can turn on your camera so we can see you as well. Oh, just a moment of... If it's not a problem, if it is, never mind. Oh, just a second. I'm having technical issues, <laughs> so... Oh, uh, never mind, reason, then. Oh. We'll focus on the presentation anyway. Just full screen the presentation again, and you're good to go. Oh. Firstly, uh, I would like to mention that I've chosen the topic women and their legal position in India from two, 500 BC to 1772. The original title was Classical Hindu Law, but I changed it in order to have a precise timeline for the, for the presentation and for the work itself. I will start with the first slide, which is titled One or Two Gods of Justice. On your left side, you can see uh, the illustration of Yamarama or Yama. He is mentioned as a god of justice, and there, there, the first mention of him as a god of justice can be found in the Rig Veda, Mandala 10. And there is a mention that a king asked Yama to send two offspring to protect his kingdom and his subjects. This is the first time he is mentioned as a god of earthly order. But in the later stages of his development, the Yampachak festival, Puranas show a completely different role in his transformation from a god of public order to a god of justice. How so? The Yampachak festival shows him as a god of death, a ruler of the underworld, and a chiron, the person who guides the soul of the dead. But the Puranas gave him the ability to judge over the souls of the dead, meaning that he could choose which souls would go into Hindu heaven or Hindu hell. While the other side, you can see Durga. She was first mentioned in the Puranas as the destroyer of a cosmic evil, to, of, a de of a large demon. And she was presented as the enforcer of, of cosmic justice. The Durga Puja festival shows us that besides her being celebrated as a goddess of cosmic order, the devotees have a precise rituals which show a principle of justice of some sorts, where instead of the classical European style of justitia, which, which is a blind goddess, meaning justice should be blind, here Durga is presented as a passionate goddess, which, which states that passion should be used to overcome obstacles rather than being blind to indifferences. Now we move on to the next slide. Uh, titled Religious Rights of Women. In the early Veda period, women were either sages or seers, but during this period, it's, it's important to note that the, this was the first time that the caste system was introduced by the Rig Vedas. You can see five castes, which are called Varnas. I apologize, I won't say the names because I don't want to butcher with my accent. But during the late Vedic period, uh, devotion to the gods was now abolished. Women could only devote themselves to, the, to their husband. At the same time, Devadasis came about. 
there were no academic consensus what would be the uniform definition. But the major outlines of the definition would be that they were professional ritualistic dancers, which attended several major Hindu festivals. There's an anecdote that most Brahmins say that usually people came to the Hindu festivals to, to see the Devadasis dance and not perform any rituals at all. But during the period of Jainism Buddhism, it's early similar to the early Vedic period, with the introduction of the Sanghas, or the Bhikkhu Sanghas, where female Buddhist nuns ran female booth, ran female only Buddhist temples. But during the Vedic period, I'm sorry, the period of Dhammasatras, the laws of Manu instated the fifth, um, which is known as a fixed rule, where women were not allowed to perform any rituals. But there's exception. There are literal and literally and archaeological exceptions to this rule. We can find them in the Ramayana, the Mahambharata, in the Diwali festival, and the Rakshabana festival. As you can see in the Ramayana, there are two instances where Sita performs two ritual rites in front of her husband, Rama, and others. In the Mahabharata, there were female yogi sages with godly powers, and they were the king's advisors. And there were several instances where they were female aesthetics, which devoted their entire lives to the practice of Diksa. The Diwali festival and the Rakshas Abandon festival are different to a certain extent. The Diwali festival mainly involves brothers and sisters. The brothers go to a sacred place to do worship, and they must return to their homes with a gift for their sisters, while the sisters and other women of the household prepare a feast for their brothers, and they chant different rituals where they ask for good health or good well or bringing wealth to the family but the laws of manu were not the only source of value in ancient india and they and they did not hold the highest position so the laws of manu had the goal to certify certain norms but they did not strictly prevent women to become to honor the gods participate in religious rites or become sages or skeptics we now move on to the royal conduct uh, for female royals and upper-class women. During the age of antiquity, ancient India usually had four types of queens. The main trait of all four types was that they were either de facto or de jure sovereign ro ro rulers, with the exception that Queen Kumadrevi was a joint ruler with her husband, meaning they participated in governing them both. During the medieval age, medieval India only had warrior queen dowagers, which were usually warrior queens which protected the kingdom when the youngest king died during battle or the king died himself it's interesting to note that the spouses of kings were not addressed as queens in the royal court but rather as daughters of great kings royal spouses and their offspring were not allowed to be to be housed in the same buildings where the king resided usually because there were several and often Assassinations, assassination attempts to kill the king himself. But now we continue with the women of the upper class. Women of the upper class received an education and they worked in several branches of government. They were also active and vocal participants of the department public pub, of the public assemblies. But bear note that they weren't allowed to enter as sapas. They were the unofficial and de facto public assemblies for men only, and most of the decisions came about there, not from the public assemblies. Now we move on to the sexual right, life and rights of women. To understand this topic, we have to differentiate between two, two things, Ritu, the period of menstruation, and Surata, pleasures of sex. Ritu was mainly translated to as a period of menstruation. A menstruating girl in a father's house was a heavy sin for, for a father. The father would, would be obliged to marry his his daughter before the period begins, and the husband could only take take her away from her home when she is sexually mature. But during this time, she must not miss her period, that's all, or have any health issues because the Brahmin caste would deem it to be a bad omen and equate it to an abortion. And also, it was a criminal offense to have <clears throat> sexual relations with a woman with her period or a woman to have her period. There was a special name for a woman who has her period and her name was a candela.
but she was obliged after the Peruvians to devote herself to the divinities of married life. If she were not to oblige with this, she would be deemed unclean and a danger to all because of the um because of the unholy magic inside of her. While we continue to sort out the pleasure of sex, we see that the Brahmin case tried to classify what would be an, an unnatural and natural forms of intercourse with the wife. And there were some successes, but they were not so sure what is an unfortunate, unnatural form and what, what wasn't, because there was a criminalization of it, because a man who does a natural form would receive a curse, or he would be expelled from his own caste or because of that. We can also see that the wife in general was deemed a property and a greater sin would befall on a man who touches another man's wife because he was equated to a robber of another man's property. But when the woman dharmas came about, a woman had the ability to ask their husbands when would, when would they like to have intercourse with them. So the Brahmins interpreted the woman's dharma to, and gave the following advice. I apologize for the profanity of it. If a man is begged by a woman for a dharma's sake, poor in deceit. But later on, the Kama Sutras were created, and they were a ritual book where, which enabled spouses to change their gender roles for a brief moment. In these rituals, the female becomes a male during the intercourse, while the male becomes a female. And he must ensure his spouse reaches her climax before him. Now we continue to the types and positions of courtesans. The Kamasutra recognizes two classifications. The first classification was just mainly used to list the most common versions of courtesans. But interestingly enough, the women which were married to washers, florists, and perfumers, and other practitioners, they were obliged to ask their, the approval of their husbands to become either a secret adulteress, an open adulteress, or theatrical artista. Well, the second classification is not of any particular concern. It just mainly boils down to depending on their quality of service, and, and that's about it. But the position of royal courtesan during the pre Buddhist period in the, in the Kama Sutras we recite was intentionally left off in the Kama Sutras itself. But it was a position where it was between a slave and a public servant because her yearly pay was 1,000 granix. The position was hereditary. Only the da only her daughters could inherit her position. She could only be freed if another man pays for her freedom, and the king accepts his offer. While on the other hand, only her son could inherit her belongings or estate if the if he or they offer the king to buy their her belongings or estate, and the king uh, accepts it. There was also high financial penalty in worth around three thousand grants for adopting or raping a royal courtesan or her daughter. So the same could expect that any kind of endangering of life of either a courtesan or her daughter would be severely punished. But the position of a common courtesan was mainly due to this. If a some, it was stipulated, if someone raped a common courtesan or such to rape her daughter, then the offender was forced to pay 2,000 granites. In the Buddhist period, all courtesans had the chance to reobtain their dignity, only they accepted to discard their material possessions. Now we move on to the topic crime punishment women. Marital infidelity of a wife of an elder or a teacher was harsh for the female offender and for the male offender. But the female offenders would be pardoned if they go on a pilgrimage or fast. But interestingly enough, adultery with the queen or adultery of the queen was not considered a crime. Also, defecating on a public road was punishable and any person who commits such a crime would have to pay a two, uh, two pounds. But pregnant women and infants would not be um, one would not be punished if they cleaned after themselves. But interestingly, using witchcraft to merely arouse a different wife or a maiden or a wife was not considered a crime. But the punishment for committing an abortion varied, and the laws of many stipulate. If an abortion has been done to a female servant, the person committing such a crime will be fined. 100 panas. If a woman procures for herself or for others medicine for the abortion, she will be exiled, and others who cause abortions will be fined two kashapas. When we see and compare the the crime the penalties, two panas, as you can see, the course of today, were a larger amount that there were slighter, slighter punishments, but for the men, they would have to pay a lot less amounts. So 
women and female offenders and male offenders were not the same, meaning the punishments were indifferent in financial values. Now we move on to the position of women in the family unit. The Euros Panishads dictated that the woman's duty was to procure a male heir in order to secure her husband's immortality. Also, a woman must be subservient to her family and his uh, to her husband and her and her his family. But interestingly enough, if a man was dead or impotent, his wife or widow in this, you know, or then depending on the situation, would come into Nyoka. Nyoka mainly mainly boils down to this: a wife could choose, or better yet, he, she could she must have sex, or better yet, sleep with an devara, a male selected by her husband or her family, or with her husband's younger brother, to conceive a male child. But there is a valid question that we ask, what would be the situation when, when a female ch child comes from this union? The Brahmins view the a female, a female child from this union to be unfit for religious functions or marriage, due to the fact that they were born from a non-lawful intercourse. But the other side, on the other side, when they were the during the bridal festivities, the bride would, would only be given to the husband by her maternal gra grandmother, maternal uncle or mother. But the legal father or the deceased man or the but yet impotent man had no obligations or responsibilities to raise the child and the family of her mother usually took care of her. Now we continue, and there were also marital restrictions because a man from the Brahman, Kasitra of Asikes, must first marry a woman from his caste, and then he can marry other women from other castes below his, below his. But also men who highly condemned and stipulated that the Brahman were broad, I'm sorry, were forbidden to marry a woman from the Sutra caste first because their actions pollute and violate the state disorder. The woman's dharma dictated and solidified that women were not either allowed to do any tasks independently, they were not allowed to seek life independently, because all those actions would lead to bringing disgrace on both families. Now, uh, the Apastampas, the Masatra, and Gautama, the Satra, defined that the husband's role over his wife was resembles the institution of a legal guardian, while the early Damasamtras enabled the husband to punish his wife in private, while the later Damasatras instructed that the only king could publicly punish another man's wife. But before the 6th century CE, women in the Gupta Emperor had two forms of property rights. Just not to name all of them, it's most important to understand that the first form was comprised of, all, was comprised of full property rights of a woman, while the second form were semi-limited properties, where the man only had use usus over them, and and he and if he even tried to alienate it, he must return return them to her with interest. While the woman's rights of inheritance is a little bit foggy to explain, but the more the main outlines were that in ancient India, the right of inheritance was closely tied to ancestral worship, and some candidates were off must offer sratka. I'm I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. But the only candidates to do such a thing were sons, grandsons, and great grandsons. But during the period of Damasatra, only the four generations of direct male descendants could inherit the Dekuyus. But women could only inherit their fathers later on if he was sonless, and if he and before he dies, he does not have a male heir. The father would only have to say, My daughter is my son, and she would become a putrika. And then she was, they were considered an equal to Arasa's son, meaning the sole heir of the father. But the test day succession is a matter of fierce academic debates, and there are two schools of One school of thought states that the Masaf succession system did not forbid writing wills, and making wills was generally allowed. There were no limitations. While well, the second school says, no, they were only inherited by acquisition of property by in state succession, and the vice under will was not allowed. They also exclude the the entire existence of a survivorship institute. And now the final slide is Sati, better, better known as the life burning of widows. Before explaining Sati, we must see what are, were the basic rights of a widow in the, when she becomes a widow. 
and stipulate that if a woman has no husband, the father, mother, brother, mother-in-law, father-in-law, or son must take care of her. If not, she will be an object of censure, meaning she would have to fend for herself. If the disappearance of her husband lasted eight to ten years, she could remarry, and if she does not have someone to take care of her, she will be allowed to adopt a son of wealth on which she can financially lean on. But the British Party is law's book added another element that proves that sati was not a mandatory practice because it allows a widow to choose either to ascend the pile after her husband, meaning that she was literally entered the pile of ashes and be burned, or choose to lead a virtuous life. Both actions would promote the welfare of her husband. But the laws of Manu and Parshara code stipulated that if a woman commits sati, she would be automatically accepted into heaven. But at the same time, whilst the Brahman, which commits sati, would not get accepted into heaven. Interestingly, again, I'm apologies for saying so much uh, interesting, interestingly so many times, but this is the last time I'll use it. Interestingly, a male royal god committed sati at a funeral of a queen as a way to honor his oath of allegiance to her. So this was the first instance in several others, which I didn't mention in this slide, where men committed sati, not only women. And that concludes my presentation. I'm open to any questions. And just a moment, uh, just to stop the sharing. And here it is. Thank you very much, Sima, and the general thanks to all presenters in this section. Um, just let's mute you so we don't have this reverberation. So now we are opening the discussion on all four papers in this panel. If anyone has questions, if you're a panelist and can unmute your microphone, please do so yourself and speak up. And if you have problems, you can raise your hand in the app or type your question in the chat. Come on, these were four very interesting papers. So I would have a question. Uh, is my camera on? Okay. So sorry. Can you hear me? We can hear you, we can see okay. you. Okay. Uh, so my question is for the first paper, and it is, I believe, uh, a colleague from Sarajevo, uh, Igor. Is he here? I hope he is. Um, yes. Okay, okay. So mm -hmm. the, the question is uh, much more food for thought rather than uh, based in the paper. So at the beginning, you said that uh, female pharaohs uh, ruling the Suyure were almost non-existent, barring from Kachepsut. But actually, even before the Ptolemaic period, there were, I believe, three or four uh, females who ruled as uh, pharaohs in their own right. So a question is basically uh, regarding the uh, women in the highest positions of power in ancient Egypt. Uh, do you think it was actually uh, an influence uh, of the uh, Hellenistic world and the so-called New Times, so after the 3rd century BC onwards, that actually uh, made it possible for a huge number of female pharaohs to come to power during the Ptolemaic period? Or do you think it was the Egyptians being, as you stated, some form of a ma matriarchal society, and, and Herodotus, of course, writing about um, that, that actually uh, influenced the Greeks into adopting the practice of, of uh, being much more um, accepting of female rulers as compared to other cultures in the ancient world? Uh, yes, thank you for that question. Yes, I wasn't referring to the, the, the last the Ptolemaic dynasty, yes, of course, and, and that is true. I, I refer to this like the indigenous period of Egyptian history, but actually the Egyptians were the ones ruling, not the Greeks, because the Ptolemaic dynasty is basically like the Greek dynasty, not the Egyptian dynasty. So I'm, I'm not sure really, I was I was thinking it over and yeah, I mean, we have to consider so like Herodotus lived in the 5th century and those Ptolemaic dynasties came after after Alexander the Great. So it was like 4th, 3rd century BC and onwards towards the Romans. So who influenced whom? I'm not really sure 
because obviously if Herodotus points out the uh, matriarchal element as opposed to the Greeks, that means the Egyptians were the ones more advanced in that regard when it comes to rights of women than the Greeks. But then, I mean, uh, the Hellenistic dynasty and the, like, the term Hellenistic, I'm, of course, I believe the the most important factor there is like the conglomerate of various elements because Hellenistic, of course, includes not only the Greek elements, but all the Oriental elements that came to be influenced by the Greeks and vice versa in the Middle East. So I'm not sure. I don't think I think that the conglomerate is so great that we cannot perceive it only as the accumulation of various um, like factors. I believe the conglomerate is so large that it uh, starts existing as uh, an individual element. So the, the the entirely new culture was developed because of those various influences. And I believe, yeah, I believe it was much more spontaneous. As I said in this private law element, I believe that it gradually evolved because of so many influences, because of so many influences just being accumulated in the north of Egypt, that it was made possible among other things for new female rulers like Cleopatra, for example, to stand out and rule the land of Egypt. So I really can't answer that question. I wish I could, but I can just guess and speculate what could have happened there. But it's really, it is, as you said, a food for thought. And that's simply um, an idea for a, a good essay, essay to be written. No, no, not for a conference, but really, I believe that someone could devote really his life's work on exploring that subject. So thank you. If I may have a question about the Leveret. Uh, if we talk about uh, the different uh, nations you mentioned in your paper, uh, how do you think uh, these nations and their conception of Leveret influenced each other? Um, good question. Well, I think Leveret developed um, many times in the history independently, uh, usually in rural societies, um, with patriarchal characteristics and uh, based on agriculture and holding of the property in the family. Uh, but uh, I also think that in the Middle East, the societies were somehow influencing each other. Uh, for example, in the Hittite society, the Leverate appeared and then it appeared in Canaan, uh, where the Hittites uh, have their sphere of influence uh, in some time of the history. And then uh, into the Israeli law, into the Bible, it was probably accepted from the Canaanic law. You know, Canaanic people were living in the Palestine before the Jewish society was established there. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, I have a brief question for the last paper uh, for Seema. Uh, you said that it was written that uh, a woman, a woman who committed sati would be automatically accepted into heaven, except for Brahmins' wives, for which it wasn't the case. Do you know why it was so? Oh, um, I could, I can't give a definitive answer, but I will try to give the best possible one, because mainly Brahmin women were, and belonging to the caste, were automatically rendered to be the clearest form of the religious purity of it all. So, if it would if they would commit sati, they would actually forfeit their own position in heaven because. Sati in that that particular I, I think I mentioned two law, law, law sources if I am correct both of them try to limit Sa Sati only to the lower caste so they can at least have a better position than the Brahmin which would which were even without Sati were given automatically entrance into heaven that would be the best answer. Okay, thank you. Other questions?
come on, we have people dealing with Mesopotamia here, with Egypt. Don't be shy. Well, since nobody is applying, I'm going to continue abusing my host rights. A question for Danica then, uh, regarding the daughters who served in temples, regardless of how we view the nature of their service. Uh, do you think that their inheritance rights were more of a special case limited to their religious function, or do you think that was a start of the idea that the daughters could inherit generally that started gradually coming first in their case? Thank you for the question. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I'm not particularly so sure which one is the case, but uh, I, I, I believe that is, um, Probably the second idea that uh, daughters could, uh, that there was possible possibility for daughters to in future inherit. And uh, that was kind of like idea for them uh, to have a better position. Um, of course, uh, in, when we're speaking particularly in Hammurabi code, that was because of their religion and because of um, their position in that way. But uh, if we're looking overall, I think that it's definitely something that um, gives up uh, that it's going to be a better position for them in the future, which was in the end um, seen later in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? There. Does someone have a question in the chat? Maybe you, Danica? Because someone mentioned that That there was a question in the chat, but I don't see it. It was obviously not sent to everyone. Okay, there is a question from Assistant Professor Milor Stankovic, also for you, Danica. So he asks, how do you interpret paragraph 182nd of Hammurabi's code, which enables the priestess of Marduk to leave her estate to whomsoever she pleases? In other words, may we consider this provision as some anachronic root of testamentary disposition in the Babylonian Empire? Uh, yes, first of all, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, I think we can. Um, and um, there is uh, a lot of uh, interesting researches on that point. And uh, I think we can find it uh, because, first of all, we know that in Hammurabian code there were no testimony, testimony uh, overall. But uh, we can see it as a beginning of uh, the possibility for a future to, to, to become uh, a testimony. So, yes, the, the answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Anyone? Of course, the presenters themselves could ask each other questions. No, nobody? Okay, in that case, we conclude our first session. Thank you very much once again. We have nine minutes left for a short break, and then at one o'clock, we continue with the second session on the position of women in ancient Greece and Rome. Thank you very much. See you soon.